Our uh, little sermon series on, uh, on vows, husbands and wives, marriage. And last week we, we uh, one aspect of my outline, my sermon, was Pastor Darren gets in trouble. Because we talked about the role of women in marriage. And yeah, if you want to see me get in trouble, and you want to understand a little bit of that role, I encourage you to go on to our website and find the YouTube video because it's important to put both the husbands and wives roles together. The idea of a woman as helper, protector, place of refuge, place to find strength to change, one who gives a safe environment to the fragile male ego. Helps her husband to become all that God wants him to be. And doing it without becoming a nag or anything, but as a Christian who lives a Christian life. You know, this whole thing about marriage is complicated. And I said last week that uh, the problem is that women these complicated lives, and men do not understand a woman. And uh, I kind of ran out of time. I, I, I was going to get to the point that often we as uh, men forget that, I don't, I don't know, we think we do this, or uh, we just never get around to this, but when men get together and chat, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about sports, we talk about the weather, we talk about business, we talk about farming. We never seem to get around to talking about how to help our women bring their emotions out. I've never been in a conversation with just men where we've talked about how we can help women with their emotional lives. And I said that it is the woman's job to help the men understand because we'll never get it. We will never understand how women work. And then at the end, I warned men that this week was going to be our week. And uh, I am sure there were a lot of women this morning trying to hurry their men along because I want you to hear your part of this. What's a perfect spouse look like? Anybody here claim to have the perfect spouse? Good, nobody. Yeah, she's not even jumping up and down. What's a perfect wife look like? I ran across, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but what the perfect wife was. Um, a great cook who always serves delicious desserts and can still fit into her wedding dress. Active in church, uh, volunteers throughout the community, and still has unlimited time for her husband and children. Someone who cares for everyone who is sick in the family and never gets sick herself. Has a great sense of humor and never is in a bad mood. She admires and praises her husband and never nags him about his faults. She comes home from work, strains the house, solves all the kids' problems, cooks dinner, gets the homework going, cleans up after dinner, starts the laundry, gets the kids back in their homework, runs to the store, irons, gets the kids to bed, talks with her husband, gets the kids back to bed after they've gotten up folds and puts away the laundry, tidies up the house, and still is brimming with energy for her husband after bed that night. Does that sound realistic? She spends an hour every day in prayer and Bible study, yet never appears more knowledgeable than her husband. She runs a taxi service for sports practice, piano lessons, etc., etc., and always joins her husband in his many recreational activities. She plans great birthday parties for kids, parents, and every other relative, special events, fun weekend getaways, surprises for friends, and wonderful vacations all within the family budget. She's always improving herself, always pays bills on time, buys the food, clothes, furniture, appliances, she grooms neatly, dresses attractively, smiles genuinely, exercises regularly, eats modestly, 
and what ways, ideally. Now, the perfect husband, according to this single statement, well, the husband is out of this. He makes lots of money without ever becoming a workaholic. He fixes everything around the whole house and never botches the job. I'm already done. <laughs> He remembers your anniversary, birthday, kids' birthday, in-laws' birthdays, engagement day, first dates day, special just for the two of us days, and every other day. He sends flowers, cards, notes, gifts, arranges special romantic getaway, getaway alone weekends, and never gives you a can opener for your anniversary. He brags about your cooking and is always ready to take you out for dinner. He is romantic, warm, sensitive, never pushy or demanding. He is capable, competent, responsible, often elevated to positions of leadership and honor in the community, and never works more than 40 hours per week. <coughs> he goes to all the kids' ball games and plays, lessons, programs, and still spends hours sharing his deepest feelings with you. He has a great sense of humor, is fun to be around, and always knows just when to switch into an in-depth conversation. He's strong, courageous, tough when needed, and never gets angry. He's kind, gentle, open, honest, vulnerable, and never withdraws or gets his feelings hurt. He always cherishes you, showering you with affection and love in all the special ways you dream about, and never, never disappoints. Wow. We're in trouble, aren't we? And as I read that second half, it reminds me how much trouble men get in. Because we're never quite there, are we? And if you look at that list and hear that list and you get a little depressed saying, hey, I've got a long ways to go, don't worry about it, we all do. Ephesians 5, though, doesn't let us off the hook quite the same way I am. Because I tell you, you're never going to live up to these expectations. Ephesians 5 says, though, you do have expectations. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We need to understand again the power of the verse that is behind me. Love. Probably heard over the years, at some point or another, that there's a bunch of words in the Bible that have to do with love. There is a common word that has to do with the love between a husband and a wife. And this is not the word in the Greek that we find in this Ephesians 5.25. The word that we find in Ephesians 5.25, according to the Greek, is the word that God has for us as people. We call that word in Greek, it's, it's agape or agape, depending on which pronunciation you want to go with. I read this, this definition this week. To subordinate one's own interests, pleasures, and personality for another's benefit. This is a definition of Christ's love for us. <coughs> and the love of Jesus has a definitive action that's attached to it, that is meant to bring about absolutely and completely a knowledge if I am loved, that I am loved, no matter if I deserve it or not. To know absolutely that there is somebody who's looking out for me, who cares about me. It's a tough concept. We find this phrase before, women, submit to your husbands. And as we looked at that, I talked about the abs how absolutely revolting to creation it is when a husband abuses that authority and abuses his wife. Why is that? Women are to submit in the model that we look at in Ephesians 5. We talked about last time, and that is about sometimes we submit our own agendas to care for our husbands. 
to look after them, to protect them, to help them to grow. And what about the men? To love your wives as Christ loved the church. And Christ gave his very life to protect the church. He gave his very life to make sure that the church knew love. I'm going to tell you, any sort of abuse of the power is absolutely contrary to what we read here. We are held to a very high standard. Many men have looked at the verses when before this verse and, and felt that they were entitled to something. There was some sort of inherent male entitlement that, uh, that I can make all the decisions. Men as a result, tend to make great generals, but very poor leaders. Because it comes from an idea that I am entitled. And as a result, men become people who give orders, and do a good job giving orders. But that leadership idea is that Christ gives us it's not so strong. Jesus came to this world. He called to himself a group of disciples. He didn't call them over and say, okay, Peter, you're to do this, James this, John this, get to work. That is not Christ's leadership. Christ's leadership was he spent years developing his disciples. Working with them, teaching them, loving them, caring them, getting down and washing their feet. He spent a minimum of three years with these small group of people. Helping them to understand their place in the world and how much that they were loved by their God. Christ's leadership model was not, I'm the one who gets to make all the decisions. Christ's leadership model was he built himself into the lives of those he loved. That's hard. We're going to discover as we go through this morning a little bit about what that means. There's an author, Steve Farrar, who writes specifically to men. He said, you want to, you want, you want to be successful? Not, not, not successful in that you have a lot of money, but successful in your family, in your marriage in the Christian life as a whole? He said, ask yourself four questions. He says, how you answer these four questions will inevitably show for men how successful they're being in these areas. Do you spend time in prayer? Oh, I wait for a lot of men, that's hard. Be quiet before God. Second question, are there one or two men who are true friends who can confide anything in, and they can ask you tough questions. Proverbs talks about iron sharpening iron. That, that kind of idea where, where you can have somebody you can, you can tell things to, they're not going to judge you, and you can ask a question. There are not very many men people in their lives like that. Third question, and this is a tough one, because we don't always have a lot of power over this. First one's about prayer. Second one's about having a confidant. The third one asks this question. Do you spend significant time with an attractive woman other than your wife? That is an indicator of how successful a man will be. You spend significant amount of time with a woman and an attractive woman. That can mean different things to different people. But you spend a lot of time Somebody like that other than your wife. And sometimes because it's a work relation, it's hard. But that's an indicator of how successful in all areas of Christian life a man can be. And fourthly, are you confident you will never fail to a major temptation? And if you say, yeah, I would never go off and cheat on my wife, or I would never do this, or I would never do that, that is an indicator that you are at risk. 
If you believe you have potential to mess up, if you understand that you are indeed a sinner, it makes a big difference. Men tend to get thrown off by all sorts of things. Money, desire for prestige, people wanting young people to think up about you. Fear of failure, fear of exposure of weaknesses. These are things that men struggle with. We need to start there with understanding we aren't Jesus, but we're called to love like Jesus does. Let's look at verses 26 and 27 to understand this a little bit better. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Women, you want to be wrinkle-free. Blemish-free. There you go. Here's the secret. And it has to do with your husband. Who would have thought that? Before a, a woman got married, one of the things that had to happen in the course of that day was she had to have a bath. I don't know why, but she did. It was actually a symbolic thing of presenting her to her husband in such a way that she was cleansed and pure. Now, you didn't have a bath every day in that culture. So having a bath could be a big thing, but it does make sense. You know? One of those significant days you should have a bath is the day you get married. I'm pretty sure I have one. I think most do. But it was a big deal in that era. And we have a, a connection here that he's making between a symbolic bath that a bride had and baptism. Catch that, baptism. Because baptism is a moment where we're presented by God, where we're brought into the kingdom of God. A wife is presented in a symbolic way to her husband as a gift, as a pure gift. I've often stood in this very spot with a, a man and woman in front of me. And sometimes we do the traditional question that is asked at the beginning of a wedding ceremony, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And we don't always do it. I, I pointed out it comes out of the Middle Ages and it has to do with a change of ownership of property. Exactly sit well with me. But there's another way to look at that question that was understood earlier than the Middle Ages, going back to the biblical era. That the woman was initially a wonderful, tremendous gift to her parents, a precious gift. And now she has been given as a precious gift to this man who stands up here. And men need to see that they have a role to play to help their wives to grow. Just like women have a role to help their men. And part of being given a gift is to take responsibility for this gift. Why? Why sacrifice? Talks about Jesus' love to the church. That's sacrifice. Being in places where it's been asked, okay, how do we sacrifice for our wives? I was reading a story this week about a, a conference, actually, where that question was asked. And they all started to throw out ideas. Initially, it started, okay, how do you sacrifice for your wife? Initially, it starts off with kind of, you know, goofy things like, oh, keep out of her way, and things like that. And then it moves into the more serious. Well, I suppose I could, I could help her with the dishes. I, I could look after the kids occasionally and let her sleep in or, or let her go off on a women's night and, and look after the kids then. Or I could, I could help, I guess, looking after the house and doing some, some of the housework. These are good things. Men, understand good, good things. Okay. And, and when we get to the third part of the outline, we're going to see why they're good things. But do you think this is what it's being talked about? In a few moments, we're going to 
finish the sermon, I promise. We're going to go have coffee. The bad thing about having coffee is there's dishes at the end. And we're going to wash the dishes, some volunteers, I hope. Otherwise, it'll be me later. But we will have the dishes to wash. Jesus loved his church. And in the way that he loves the church, did he come to the earth to say, do you know what, I love you so much, I'm going to help you with the dishes? I, I, I had a light bulb moment this week, that, and, and it wasn't even a good light bulb moment, because it scared me the implications. <clears throat> That when he talks about us being sacrificial in our love, he's talking about something much deeper than even us just helping out with the dishes now. Something much bigger. The purpose of love is to perfect the one being loved. The purpose of my love for my wife is not, catch this, not to make her happy. Although, hopefully, that is a byproduct. I wish every marriage here happiness. This is my point. Happiness is a good thing, but it is not the purpose. It is not the purpose. And we should not act as if it was the highest goal. The highest goal is to make her more like what God wants her to be. Jesus' goal was to make the church beautiful. And it's saying by the husband and wife, Jesus sanctifies. And we have this word sanctifies here in this passage as well. When Jesus talks about sanctifying his church, he takes people, he sets them apart. They are set apart by God to take up their role in the kingdom of God. You take a wife, You're setting her apart from the world. To lavish attention upon her so she is free to be all that God created her to be. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Problems of Pain, goes about talking about the love. He's not about wanting somebody else just to be happy. And he comments on love by saying this. By love, most of us mean kindness. The desire to see others, then the self happy. Not happy in this way or that way, just, just happy. And he goes on to talk about the fact that God is not like this. And so when he says that God is not like this, he says, God does not govern the universe on such lines. And since God is love, I conclude that my conception of love needs correction. Love demands the perfect of the beloved. That the mere kindness which tolerates anything except suffering its object is in that respect at the opposite pole from love. In other words, it's okay sometimes as a couple to struggle. It's okay to suffer as long as the goal is to become better. Become more like Jesus. The example of love in a marriage is Christ's love. And the expectation is to be made more like Jesus. When I read 1 Peter 3, it's a similar passage to Ephesians 5, a little bit of a different take. But wives there are encouraged to be beautiful. To be beautiful. But not... They wear lots of jewelry and fancy clothes and do up their hair nice. It's not necessarily saying there's anything wrong with that. But that's not how a woman is really made beautiful. A beautiful woman, according to Peter, is one who knows how to show respect, to act in purity, to demonstrate gentleness. And husbands have a crucial role in bringing out that respect, that purity, that gentleness. And husbands, and this is the part of this verse that men don't really like, husbands have to do it in knowledge. I, I said earlier, 
That we don't sit around and talk about how to, how to help our wives with our feelings. And we don't, we don't understand this stuff, but we never will understand this stuff. But I'm going to tell you, man, that does not excuse us from trying. I would like to be excused from, oh, I'm just a stupid, I can't understand women's feelings anyway. That doesn't give me the right to not try. Because it talks about knowledge in 1 Peter. Maybe that's the most important word for husbands in the whole Bible about how to be a husband is knowledge. To know. To learn. We need to listen to find out how to help them be all that they can be. Help them realize their God-given dreams. To help them to grow. To help them to be encouraged. To help them to feel loved. It's tough. The same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. There is one piece of really good news in here, guys. One really good piece of news, and that's the word should. I think right within that word should is an acknowledgement that we're not always going to get it right. This is where we're aiming towards. This is where we're headed. Know that no husband loves his wife the way Christ loves the church. And loving your wife in this way going to change you, though. Because it's the same as loving yourself. Our lives, when we're husband and wife, become completely intermingled. And there is no way to unintermingle them. I don't know if that's a word. But there's no way to pull apart. I don't know how many times, I talked about doing weddings up here, I don't know how many weddings I've done, and there's been a lot of them, where the biggest amount of energy spent Probably the most amount of talking done and getting ready for the wedding isn't preparing the vows, isn't talking about how we're all going to walk in or, or where the flowers are going to go. The biggest amount of time spent talking is about how we're going to keep mom and dad apart because if we get them in the same row, they're going to start arguing. And that is tragic. I bet in over half of the weddings that I have performed over the years, that has been a major component of what we've talked about is how do we keep parents that are divorced apart. It isn't tragic that that falls on the kids. You can't, even when you divorce, just separate. It doesn't work like that. Those feelings are there at all the weddings and birthday parties and family gatherings that are going to go on forever. You can't take them out. So I've often sat here and we pointed that row and that row and tried to figure out where uh, we separate mom and dad by this many seats, maybe we will be okay. But we have to make sure that they're both, you know, an equal place to watch it because otherwise one of them is going to be mad. That happens because there's still jealousy, there's still feeling, there's still things happening. marriage is healthy, the husband and wife become extensions of each other. A story this week of a family that um, they lived off in a big city and their child was getting married to somebody out in the country in uh, western Oregon. And so they went to a big outdoor picnic there and getting to know each other, the families, when all of a sudden somebody yelled, Rattlesnake! Aren't you glad we don't have to deal with them? A little bit farther south of us, you might. They heard the yell, and immediately this family that was from the city were amazed that there was a procedure that immediately happened. The wife went and grabbed a shovel, and it went to the wife, and she immediately went for the head of the rattlesnake. Use the shovel to get the head off. And then they had a careful way to dispose of this rattlesnake. The person 
Webster's reading said that Satan's called a snake. We should be dealing with him the same way. With an immediate urgency in dealing with the issue. In our marriage, we need to keep on working on energizing the marriage to keep it strong and healthy. If you want to grow in serving your wife, if you want to grow as a helper to your husband, do you know what? Think of marriage almost like a bank. That doesn't sound very romantic, does it? What do you do at a bank? You, usually if you're going there, you're going to do one of two things. You're either putting money in or you're taking money out. And there's times where all of us make withdrawals in marriage. I say something really stupid. None of the other husbands can relate to this, right? You say something dumb, or you do something dumb, it's a withdrawal. You act selfishly, you do something, it's a withdrawal. What, 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 what happens when you have nothing left in the bank? If you just do withdrawals, after a while you're going to be in a lot of trouble, right? Sometimes you have to go into the bank to make deposits, put some money in. And guess what? In marriage, it's like that as well. Sometimes we have to do things to put deposit. That, that, that's where doing the dishes comes in, by the way. That's where doing things for your partner comes in to play. We have to do things to put deposits into our marriage. What do women look for? I, I, was, yeah, I did a lot of reading lots about marriage. Talked about Ten needs that we have in one book I was reading. And said there's five that are really strong for women and five that are really strong for men. We need all ten. What do women need? Talked about affection, conversation, honesty, financial support, family commitment. Men look after these things. And that's putting deposits into your marriage. You do things like sit down and talk. You be honest, including things like our feelings. Financial support would be things like, it doesn't even have to be money. I mean, you don't have to give your white money. But you give flowers, that's, that's kind of a, it doesn't. All those things, those are ways to put deposits in here. For women, what can you do for your man? What were the five strongest things that came up with? Were this, sexual fulfillment. Not surprise. Recreational companionship. Having an attractive wife. Domestic support. In other words, encouraging him. Join him admiration. And building your partner's self-esteem. You have to miss that. You know, men need self-esteem built up. You know, a strong marriage is being proactive with dealing with struggles and keeping it strong. And the effort that one of us puts into our marriage, either one of us, benefits both of us because husbands, when you love your wife, you're loving yourself. You're loving your own body, it says here. So understand this. We are all servants of God. All of us. And God has called us to a specific purpose. Men, you're releasing your wives to be all that they were created to be because God has created them to be something special. They are a gift to you. Help them to be all that they can be. And do things to build into their lives, to encourage, to help. It's hard. It's worth the effort.